Okay, so next up, as you may know and have seen on the logotype of 23C3, uh, you will find that the logotype, one of the elements is an apple. And if you don't already know that this apple is representative of, this is the apple of Discordia. And I, I, have a, I have a ThinkPad of Discordia, and I know a lot of you have an Apple of Discordia. Um, but really, what, what is Discordianism? Um, and we have a guest here named Autumn, who runs um, Discordian.com. And she will be talking with us, with Fox, her, um, her uh, partner. To, they're going to talk about culture jamming in Discordianism and essentially um, the movement of discordanism and pranksters throughout history and how this, the prankster has become the prophet in some ways. And so could you please give a warm welcome to Ottoman Fox. Hi, everybody. If you're wondering why I'm alone on stage, that's because my co-presenter did all of our fabulous visual aids. I can assure you if I was the one doing them, they would be like a third as cool. So you can thank him for that. And there we go. So I'd like to start out by showing one of the original myths of Discordianism. Now, Discordianism, as you may know, is somewhere between a joke and a religion, but it does have a myth system. So we put together a little presentation for you. It's called The Original Snub. Now, this is a wedding invitation list. There was a wedding going on in ancient Greece between Peleus and Thetis, two nobles. And they invited all of the gods that were available, and a few other people, you'll notice. But they neglected to invite Eris. Now, you might notice Steve Jobs had the grace to go off and find himself a party somewhere, but Eris said, forget that. Eris wanted to go to this wedding and was a little bit upset, as you might be, to find that all of her friends were invited, but she was not. You'll see her looking very sad here. Now, these other goddesses put on a big show preening about how they were invited, and Eris was not so fond of this. So she had a bright idea. She knew that the gods had egos well beyond their actual godly stature. And so she got a golden apple and inscribed with it the word Kalisti, which means for the prettiest one, and rolled it into the hall of this wedding. All of the gods said, that's mine, that's mine. Now, you might expect if somebody leaves a beautiful piece of gold at a wedding that maybe it's for the bride. But in this case, the gods said, no, it must be mine because I'm the prettiest one here. Forget you guys. Well, as we all know, the father of the gods was Zeus. And Zeus did not want to piss off any one of these fine ladies. So Zeus wasn't going to say, well, it's yours and risk the wrath of the other two. So Zeus did something a little tricky. He passed the responsibility off to Paris, the Prince of Troy, a mortal. And, you know, hey, it's a mortal, who cares, right? And so he said, Paris is going to choose who to give this apple to tomorrow. And of course, the goddesses are all sneaky, and they came to him in the middle of the night and they offered him things. Harris, Hera, rather, offered him dominion over the world. She offered him much of Asia, in fact. Athena offered him wisdom of the ages, knowledge far beyond mortal means. And Aphrodite offered him the most beautiful woman in the world. Well, as mortal men are wont to fail, that's who he chose. Uh, hello. Okay, and we see that Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in the world, was in fact already married to the king of Sparta, Troy's biggest enemy. Well, the rest is history. Here we see the Trojan War, 
And this was what started it all. What we can take from this in discordianism and culture jamming is that this never would have been a problem if the gods had said, well, hey, this is clearly a wedding gift, we'll give it to the bride. The problem was that their egos far exceeded anything that could have gone on in that room. And thus, the original snub was born. So today, I'm going to give a talk about discordianism and culture jamming, and I'm going to go with the model of the discordian seasons. The discordian seasons are sort of phases of society, right? First, there's chaos, where there's just no rules at all. And then we move into discord, where there's still no rules, but people are starting to get a little upset about that, because, well, something's happening, and you don't like it, and maybe there should be a law. And then we move into confusion, as some rules start to take effect, but nobody is sure where to follow the rules or what rules to follow. And then into bureaucracy, where this is all strictly codified. We have five rules, and you cannot break them. And then to the aftermath, when finally we move beyond categories. So in chaos, we're going to talk about discordianism. First, I'll give you a little bit of a biography, just a two-second word. Uh, I run Discordian.com. I've been involved in various prankster organizations, such as the Cacophony Society, for a fairly long time. My co-presenter here uh, likes to come with me to a number of these events. He's a former administrator for a harm reduction board called BlueLight.New, if some of you are familiar with it. And not only that, but he's also done most of the art for my website and for this presentation. Lastly, I need to give a disclaimer. I'm American. A lot of these examples are American because I'd like to tell you what I know about as opposed to what I don't. I did do some research on this, but I figured it's better to talk about what I know best. Not only that, but I tried to give a more discordian focus to this talk, so there's a number of people and groups and events that are incredibly fascinating in the world of culture jamming, but I wasn't able to get to them because I was trying to keep this a more narrow focus. Now, discordianism started with two crazy hippies hanging out in a bowling alley in the middle of the night in Los Angeles in 1959 or 1958. They can't remember. And they said, hey, I heard about this ancient Greek goddess of chaos. Wouldn't it be funny if somebody started a religion? Well, thank goodness it didn't turn into Scientology. But instead, we have something a little bit stranger. Now, the two guys that started this, Kerry Thornley and Gregory Hill, both of whom went on to have fascinating careers in the arts and all sorts of places. Uh, well, all sorts of places is interesting. Kerry Thornley, this is a little tidbit, uh, was actually mistaken for Lee Harvey Oswald during the Kennedy assassination. So we found this lovely cover of the original Principia Discordia, the writing from Discordian Society, in the Kennedy archives. I find that fascinating. So the two of them wrote this book. And it's a collection of essays and random parables and pieces of art. They offered pope cards to suggest that everyone who has one of these cards is in fact a pope. That is, someone who's under their own authority. And in fact, if you're interested, I've got a few. Then, a few years down the line, some of the crazy people they were hanging out with wrote a book. Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea wrote the Illuminatus Trilogy and its follow-up, the Schrodinger's Cat Trilogy, two large works of bizarre fiction. They go through uh, memos, they go through politics, magic, sex, all kinds of things that were coming up in the 1970s. Uh, and really, the Illuminatus Trilogy is what's popularized discordianism to where it is today. Sorry about this, this runs a little slow. I know you guys all like free software. Well, I got free hardware. Okay, one of the biggest follow-ups to Discordianism was the Church of the Subgenius. 
And if you've ever heard of Slack or Reverend Ivan Stang, there's this whole group of people that put on what they call devivals, essentially parodies of Christian revivals, where people run around dancing naked and talking about how the aliens are going to come down and make it all better. They're good people, and they've influenced a number of people, uh, including artists' negative land that we're going to talk about later in this presentation. So the current state of Discordianism today is largely online. You can see things like Alt Discordia or Principia Discordia.com or the live journal Discord Society, where most of what's happening in Discordianism today is online uh, conversations. People have conversations on everything from esoteric philosophy to bizarre politics to really what they ate for dinner yesterday. It's a little bit like blogging. There are, however, a couple of actual gatherings in person. The biggest one is the Free Spirit Gathering. While not explicitly Discordian, it's a large pagan festival where people, again, come dance around naked around fires. I guess that's a big thing. And they have a Discordian programming tract. Then in February of every year, there's a large pagan convention in the San Francisco Bay Area called PantheaCon. There are several people who present Discordian rituals every, there every year. I'm one of them. And then lastly, there is the Discordian convention that I host every year. I've been doing that for the past five years. It's kind of like having 20 of your strangest house guests for a weekend. It's a whole lot of fun. We do ritual and... Uh, I'll get into that in a moment. But we also uh, sit around singing bizarre campfire songs, make up games, and uh, have occasional public events. Now I'd like to talk about the more occult aspects of this. A long, long time ago in the 1600s, the Rosicrucians published this manifesto talking about the Rosicrucian society and how it was full of bright, intelligent, fabulous people. And then suddenly, everybody was a Rosicrucian. One of the things that we see in culture jamming and in discordianism is this doctrine of build it and they will come. This idea that when we talk about some fabulous organization, simply by talking about it, people will want to join, and then we'll tell you that they've joined. And then, suddenly, your organization exists. Now, more recently, we can see some work in Discordianism that descends from Aleister Crowley's work, uh, which talks about the will as the supreme force, and uh, Phil Hine and Austin Osmond Spare and a number of other uh, theorists who write things about chaos magic. Now, what's interesting about this is that I'd like to give you a, a more utilitarian version of this. I would like to define magic as a symbolic act undertaken to affect change. So this isn't always somebody who even believes in some bizarre supernatural forces, so much as somebody who is working with a symbol in order to affect change. So we'll see that as we see people trying to deconstruct and reconstruct corporate logos. And that is, in fact, a form of magic. Now, those who engage in chaos magic do something similar. Chaos magic says that belief itself is powerful, and it's sort of like a brain hack. Like, if you believe in something so strongly, you're more likely to have a chance of actually being able to accomplish this. And so what they do is they choose a system to believe in in order to get these results, and then when it becomes inconvenient, laugh it off. So, for example, we've all heard of various gods in mythology, and some of them are better at some things than others. So if you strongly need emotional healing, maybe you would pray to Jesus. Jesus was pretty good at that. But then if you need to go get laid, Jesus is not your man. <laughs> so the next person you might talk to would be maybe Pan. There's a group of people called the Z Cluster who've done a lot of chaos magic rituals, including most notably a uh, Elvis resurrection ritual, where they attempted to resurrect the spirit of Elvis. Now, again, nobody expected the king to come walking up from under the grave, but I guess they all had a little bit of extra swing in their step. Now let's move into Discord. 
And here's where I'm going to talk about culture jamming. Now, culture jamming is a form of art that uses existing channels and ideas to convey information that is critical of mass culture. It often also uses humor to slip past defensiveness towards new ideas. In Mark Deary's seminal work on culture jamming, he says, part artistic terrorists, part vernacular critics, culture jammers introduce noise into the system as it passes from transmitter to receiver, encouraging idios idiosyncratic, unintended interpretations. Todd Teachin uh, elaborates by saying, jam art is centered in a form of cooperative subversion, which attempts to subvert the workings of pre-existing media by transforming the message into its own anti-message. So, I'm going to show you some examples, because that's a whole lot of academic jargon. Now, here's a logo that we're all incredibly familiar with. Here's one way of changing that. Now, again, what they're doing is they're piggybacking this extra information onto something that immediately and viscerally hits you. I wanted to give a lot of examples of the same logo and how it can be used in different ways because it gives you an idea of some of the variety of culture jamming. Culture jamming media takes the form of billboard liberation, where people will change a billboard to reflect new ideas. It takes the form of what they call subvertisements. This is from a group called Adbusters. If you're not familiar with them, check them out. They're fabulous. It takes the form of graffiti. It takes the form of sticker campaigns. It takes the form of text that uses original works. It takes the form of copyright violation. This one in particular I found very interesting. It came to me from a website called the Worcester Collective that documents street art. This was in China by a man who calls himself the, himself the people's liberation artist. In particular, this is a really important uh, sentiment in China right now, as China struggles to figure out exactly where it wants to be in terms of commercialization. Here's another one of Adbuster's famous, what they call subvertisements. This is a play on Joe, or, well, this is Joe Camel. And here's the Adbusters version, Joe Chemo. Now, from an artistic example, I'm going to move into an event example of culture jamming. This is what's called St. Stupid's Day Parade. Now, the first Church of the Last Laugh was founded in 1978 by Bishop Joey. And Bishop Joey looked around the world and I said, what is the one enduring characteristic of humanity? And the answer he came up with was stupidity. So he decided, why not revel in it? If you've got to be stupid anyways, why not have a good time being stupid? So every year on April 1st, they have the St. Stupid's Day Parade in San Francisco. It winds through downtown and it's thousands of people dressed as stupidly as possible. And next, I want to move on to a ritual example. A lot of people in this audience will be familiar with Alan Moore's V for Vendetta comic. It was a graphic novel put out about a character who dresses up in a, in a Guy Fox mask, uh, essentially mimicking the revolutionary person from England when he went to try and create a new societal revolution. There was a recent movie of the same graphic novel. What's fascinating about this is that somebody decided to piggyback on this in a ritual context. And in early October of this year, the website was passed around amongst friends and wor by word of mouth that had an invocation of V. So 
Guy Fox attempted to blow up the Parliament building in England on November 5th. Well, this ritual on midnight of November 5th incited people all over the world to wear a mask just like this character and to invoke the character using words like "thee, we invoke thee, we invoke thee, thee." Lead us in your, uh, lend us your conviction, your priority of purpose. So we see something like this, and while it's not necessarily pulling in some sort of unseen force, you can also see how by invoking these equalities in ourselves, it can help become a revolutionary force for social change. Not only that, but this sort of pop culture magic allows people to, anytime they then see an image like this, maybe from the movie, maybe from the stickers or somebody's T-shirt, to remember that ritual that they did and thus call that that energy back up in themselves again and again and again. My group has done this at PantheaCon when last year we did a ritual invoking the ancient、uh, Egyptian world of the dead using Muppets. Now, next time people look at the Muppets, they're going to start thinking about the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. Who else would make that connection? So now, confusion. When there are some rules, and you're not really sure where to go, this is the Cacophony Society. The Cacophony Society was founded originally as a group called the Suicide Club. The idea was to live each day as if it were your last. The Suicide Club said that so many of us are constantly putting our desires second for some sort of beautiful future that may or may not come, and so instead, what we should do is today have the crazy parties, is today climb that tree you've always been thinking of. So, since then, the Cacophony Society has evolved, and there are chapters all over the world, most notably San Francisco and Los Angeles. This is a picture of one of their events. I can show you a few more. This is SantaCon, and some of you may have heard of this. SantaCon gets about a hundred people dressed up in a Santa suit to some location, incredibly drunk, and often doing such things as, in this case, protesting. I'm there with the sign "Make Toys, Not War." This is New York, 1998. The first SantaCon in New York. Was the one that I went to, and we did things like hop the subway. We got our pictures taken with cops. We went to a strip bar and we made the strippers blush. We protested on UN Plaza, and now SantaCon takes place all over the world. There are SantaCons in cities all across the United States, and some in Europe, and some in Canada. If you look up Santarchy.com. Not only that, but we also pass out、uh, lumps of coal. If you're familiar with that myth, if you've been a bad boy or girl, you get a lump of coal, and went around and decided who was naughty, who was nice. Now, this just looks like a bunch of people in random costumes, but this is what's known as the Urban Iditarod. If you're familiar, the original Iditarod is the Alaskan dog sled race that takes place every year over miles of frozen tundra. Well, San Francisco decided it was time to take the Iditarod to San Francisco, with people dressed up in dog costumes pulling shopping carts through the tourist parts of the city on a Saturday, and stopping at every bar along the way. One event that has taken on a life of its own that originally came from Santa Con is Burning Man. Many of you have probably heard of the Burning Man Festival, although I know a European audience isn't as familiar. Burning Man is a large festival in the middle of the Nevada desert every year in August that draws up to, at this point, 50,000 people who come and camp out for a week. One of the things that's incredibly fascinating about this is it is an exercise in free culture. There are very few rules, and those that exist largely exist to maintain safety and privacy of spaces that have been set up ahead of time. Not only that, but it's a gift economy. In fact, money is only allowed in two locations: one location where people can purchase coffee, and the other location where people can purchase ice. Everywhere else, the intent is to be able to give and receive freely. Burning Man originally started as just a San Francisco cacophony event on a beach somewhere in San Francisco. People dress up or not, however they may see fit.、Uh, This photo I can credit to somebody here in the audience is, yeah, 
go Jacob. This is um, a group who put on something called the Never Was Hall. It's in fact a three-story Victorian building on wheels. What makes this culture jamming is that while it doesn't necessarily use existing media, it offers people the chance to become their own media in an environment rarely seen outside of such a temporary autonomous zone. Hakim Bey came up with the idea of the temporary autonomous zone, stating that this is a, a zone without set rules for a very certain period of time. After a certain period of time, those community guidelines become set rules, and then things start to deteriorate. But Burning Man is a perfect example of a temporary autonomous zone. Next, I'd like to talk about, uh, well, this is Burning Man, as you can see from, from the satellite image from Google Earth. It's gotten huge from a group of something like 20 people about 20 years ago. Next, I'd like to talk about a man called Banksy. Banksy is a street artist, or perhaps multiple street artists, who's been involved in the graffiti scene for a long time. Well, most recently, he has taken to making wonderful, beautiful paintings and sneaking them in to museums. <laughs> Again, somebody to look up He went into a number of museums and galleries, and you can see in these pictures, surreptitiously placed his own painting there. Most of them uh, look like fairly classical works of art with something bizarre and modern. A lot of them are uh, old portraits, maybe with a can of spray paint next to them or something. So the medium was exactly the same. You can see the spray paint here. But the subject was similar, but subtly tweaked and he had them in frames, and he even had a little plaque mimicking the same style as the museum's original plaques for all of their other paintings. And he went in, and he just wore a big coat, put it in there, and walked away. Now, in some cases, it actually took the museums more than a week to discover these. It's a fascinating concept on what makes something worthy of being in a museum, what, where that lies if this is part of the public trust. Here's more of the images here. And here's somebody just walking by. Now, I don't have an image of this, but another event that I wanted to tell you about was something that we did at the most recent Callisticon Discordian Convention. We held a generic protest. So we had signs that said, yes, no, maybe, stuff here to meet girls. And we carried these big signs in a big circle in the middle of Union Square in San Francisco. It's a busy commercial district. On a Sunday afternoon, about 10 of us chanting slogans like, yes, no, we don't know. <laughs> and we had a really great time. And people kept honking at us, and people kept saying, so what is it that you advocate? Well, stuff. We think stuff is good. And then somebody else would pipe up, no, stuff is bad. I'm here against stuff. <laughs> We've been intending to hold these regularly, so if you happen to be in San Francisco, come find me afterwards. Here's more of Banksy. <laughs> now we move into bureaucracy. What happens when we have strongly codified rules? Well, as all of you here know, people are going to start breaking them. And in order to break these rules, we often have to get creative. So one of the things that ties this in to Discordianism explicitly is that the Principia Discordia was one of the first works that I'm aware of marked with all rights reversed. 
It was partially a joke on the word all rights reserved, but it was also because the people who wrote this knew that some of the works that they put into the Principia Discordia might have been copyrighted, but they weren't sure, and they really just didn't want to deal with that. So Discordianism itself has a rich history of using copyleft and all rights reverse techniques. And one of the things that I find so fascinating is that there's now a whole movement of free software and free culture that is essentially partially descended from Discordianism. Well, I want to talk about a band called The Jams. In 1987, and I'm going to play a, a sample for you in a minute, but in 1987, uh, this group, The Jams, they grabbed their name, by the way, from the Illuminatus Trilogy, published uh, this album called 1987, What the Fuck is Going On? And one of the songs was called The Queen and I, and it uses an ABBA sample. So let me uh, play this for you so you can hear what I'm talking about. Hopefully this is going to work. Okay. I'm trying to double click it. I guess I'm getting jammed too. I don't think it would be. All right, well, while he's trying to figure this out, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about it. It uses an ABBA sample called uh, From the Dancing Queen, and it really pissed off ABBA. There was a huge, huge lawsuit, and because of this, the Jan said, all right, screw you guys, and changed their name to the KLF which stands for the Copyright Liberation Front. Give me a second, I'm going to do it manually. Okay, so this will be one second. We're going to pull this up manually here so you can hear what we're talking about. But uh, the KLF have become kind of media pranksters in general. One of the things that's bizarre about them is in 1992, they erased their entire back catalog. Not only that, but they actually took their entire earnings from the KLF, which was one million pounds sterling, and burned it all of it, in a giant media event. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here's the sample of the Queen and I, hopefully. Want to know who's in control? Is it you or God or the bloke down the door? Her answers were shy, but I didn't give up. So I went to the Lord, but they didn't me wake up. So I went to the palace, good Queen Beth. She asked me to dance, said she'd like a rest. Boy, do you be king? I'll have to get the throne. Here's the keys to the castle. You're in control. Thanks. And we've got one from the KLF too, right? Okay. Yeah, so we've also got a sample from the KLF. They started to use a number of illegal samples. Um, how come we're blank here? They probably just pulled it. Okay. Do you want to? It's a very short sample.
Okay. Mm. KLF is gonna rock you. <laughs> All right, there we go. And let's get my display back up. Anyways, after the KLF, I also want to mention a band called Negative Land. Now, Negative Land is actually the band that coined the term culture jamming in the first place in the mid-80s. And they're a group of subgenius uh, audio hackers, essentially, who had been doing work with uh, an hour of Slack, an original radio program produced by the Church of the Subgenius. They did something with a U2 song, and they've gotten sued all kinds of times. This is American Top 40. I have climbed the highest mountains, and guess what? I've run through the fields, only to be with you. Yep, with you. No one else, just you. Here's the first top 40 hit, and guess what? For the Irish band from Dublin who call themselves U2. I have run, I have crawled, I have scaled these city walls. Yeah, that's really great. I can't believe I did it, but nevertheless, I have done that for you. That's the letter U and the numeral two. Only to be with you I've done all these things. The yeah, with you, the fat one, that's it. The You're the fat one, and I want to be with you. What's the matter? I say, uh, why was it changed here? But, on the other hand, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. That's the letter U and the numeral two. The four-man band features Adam Clayton on bass, Larry Mullen on drums, Dave Evans, nicknamed The Edge, on... This is bullshit. Nobody cares. These guys are from England, and who gives a shit? Oh, God. Just a lot of wasted names that don't mean diddly shit. I for sure. You don't know where you are shit about you. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. Sounds like it's portal. Yeah. Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Yeah, it is Diddly shit. Diddly shit. Okay, great. So, Negative Land put out an album, in fact, entitled U2, that was one of the head singles from this, and predictably got sued. But yet, that was also part of the art. Part of what they were trying to point out is the ridiculousness of where culture says that you're not allowed to remix something. I think it's pretty clear that nobody's going to mistake that for the original U2 song. And if we can get me uh, back up here, you can go ahead and click through to the next one. Okay, I need to get my images back up. Tech support, can you help me out here? Okay, we're getting a video angel, so. In the process, what I can do is move on to the last season, and that is the aftermath. That's what happens when we move beyond these categories of order, disorder, chaos, discord, confusion. Yeah, thanks, guys. And what I want to start out with here is what happens when culture jamming becomes mainstream. So this is a Cacophony Society event that started in the late 80s. Now in San Francisco, there's a huge race that goes through the city called the Beta Breakers. So it's where you are running from the San Francisco Bay to the ocean. I don't remember how long it is, but it's a big deal. Thousands and thousands of people come run through the streets of San Francisco every year. Well, a man named Rob came up with the idea that it would be hilarious to dress up in salmon costumes and run the opposite way to spawn. <laughs> this is Rob's original salmon costumes. Uh, they're not very comfortable. I did this one year. They're actually made of carpet padding. But. Still, it's lots of fun. You go run the opposite way, and then you do your little spawning dance, and everybody has a great time. Well, this has apparently entered the meme stream. These two just came out within the past year. There is a television commercial from Bacardi showing people running through the streets of New York in fish costumes, and this Nike billboard. So one of the things that I think is so important about uh, Lawrence Lessig when he was talking last night about that non-commercial license is so that perhaps your art doesn't end up here. Something to think about. 
Not only that, but uh, even outside of taking people's ideas, corporations have started to engage in underground media techniques. Several years ago, there was a campaign by IBM when they were trying to push their Linux servers to get people to write Peace Love Linux. They had the peace sign, the heart sign, and a little penguin. Well, it turns out that IBM actually paid taggers to graffiti this on the streets of New York and San Francisco. This did not go over so well with the municipalities when they found out about it. But it's very interesting because when we come back to the theme of the conference here, it really brings us back to who can you trust, right? If you're expecting to trust something because it's underground, because it's graffitied somewhere, that means it's cool. Well, maybe it just means that they're being paid to do it, and it's something to pay attention to. So this is the last thing that I want to talk about here. Well, one of the last is what I call the death of irony. Now, some of you may be familiar with this satirical newspaper, TheOnion.com, or just The Onion. Well, January 17, 2001, they published this article, Bush, our long national nightmare of peace and prosperity is finally over. This is the annotated edition that came out just a year ago with links to every single thing that has actually happened from this article. It's pretty disturbing when The Onion is prophesizing something that comes out in reality. And it doesn't just go for politics either. If you are familiar with the disposable razor industry, you might have heard of the razor wars between Gillette and Schick, two companies that are making disposable razors for men. Well, first of all, Gillette came out with the three-blade razor because it was superior to the old two-blade razor. And then Schick came out with the four-blade razor. Well, about two years ago, The Onion published an article saying, Gillette, fuck it, we're going to five blades. <laughs> Eighteen months later, they did. <laughs> so, I've got some links up on my website. There's a links page. And if you come back later tonight, I will have a specific further reference for anybody here who wants to take a look at any of the groups that I mentioned or any of the people that I feel are incredibly important that I wasn't able to mention. I want to tell you a little anecdote that I heard recently. There's a television show called Dateline NBC. And they got a number of small children, you know, seven-year-olds, right? And they were curious as to how pervasive advertising has really come into society. So they decided to try this out. They gave the seven-year-olds a choice. We have two cupcakes. One is a plain chocolate cupcake with chocolate frosting. The other is exactly the same, but has a picture of Spider-Man in frosting. Which one do you want, they said. The kids chose the Spider-Man cupcake. Because it'll taste better, they said. Dateline wasn't so sure about this, so they decided to check it out. Then they offered the kids a choice between the plain cupcake, chocolate cupcake, chocolate frosting, and a banana that they put a little Scooby-Doo sticker on. Which one would you rather have? The kids chose the banana. So then, just to take this into the realm of absurdity, they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to see through this. So they got a giant rock, and they put a bunch of stickers on the rock. And they gave the choice between the sticker-covered rock and a banana, a plain banana. And they said, which one would you rather eat for breakfast? And the kids said, the rock. And they said, are you sure? The rock, they said. Now, it's true the kids probably weren't planning on actually eating the rock for breakfast. They probably figured that this might get them a shiny new rock with stickers. But at the same time, it really says something about the culture that we find ourselves in today. So, to sum that all up, I want to point out that Discordianism has a wide and varied history. Culture jamming is used by corporations and the underground alike. And uh, before I end, I'd like to thank a number of people. This is also up on my website, but I'd like to thank all of you here today. I'd like to specifically thank Jacob, Jacob Applebaum for getting me here in the first place. I'd like to thank the Discord Society community on LiveJournal for seriously helping me out. And 
uh, my mother, God, Eris, and certainly not to mention my co-presenter, Fox, here. So I'd like to end with the last part of the Principia Discordia, the writing from Discordianism. It's called Nonsense as Sense. If you can master nonsense as you have already learned to master sense, then each will expose the other for what it is, absurdity. May the goddess put twinkles in your eyes. May you have the knowledge of a sage and the wisdom of a child. Hail Eris. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank Fox for putting together these fabulous visual aids. We've been working very, very hard on them, and they're wonderful. Yeah, even if they didn't all work. Does anybody have any questions? What's so, what's so bad about the Nike ad? Um, is, it, is it really the, the, the best way to move forward to put, uh, to put art under non-commercial license in order to sue Nike? Isn't it? Um, I know you got a love affair with absurdity, but I don't get that. Okay. No, that's a very valid point. What's so wrong about corporations using these ideas? Well, I think, first of all, the problem with it is that they're not attributing this to, the, to anybody in the first place. So they're essentially claiming it as their own idea, which I see as plagiarism, which I do have a moral problem with. Not only that, but they're also not compensating anybody for that idea. And as a company that is driven by profit, that makes a huge amount of profit on an idea, I think that there is something to be said for allowing your ideas to be shared with others only so long as maybe you get a cut of what they might be getting in return. I also think that by having something like a non-commercial license, should you choose to do that, you offer yourself the opportunity to turn it down if you want to. So you may in fact say, okay, but if you're interested in a commercial license, come talk to me and then make that choice individually instead of seeing your artwork up on a company that you may or may not like, which could be pretty disturbing. Um, I would like to come back on that again, <laughs> but just before I would like to say that uh, the companies and the capitalism is not just assimilating slogans and the ideas and the playing with the meanings of science and signifi uh, signifiers, whatever, is that the, the capitalism uh, assimilates organizational structures, production structures, uh, so you can easily see that the things which were very, very subversive in the 60s, which were from, from counterculture, just became the mainstream corporate culture where you have team building, everybody being uh, creative, uh, going for some workshops, brainstorming, and all kind of things which they didn't have at the time when counterculture was. So it's really hard to see how to fight if you don't want to, as to capitalism to assimilate things just because of profit. So I, I found that uh, saying that the non-commercial is the way how you can protect that is very ironic because still you, need, you will again need lawyers to tell you what is non-commercial and what, and what is commercial because then Nike will probably uh, 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 found some kind of uh, humanitarian whatever uh, company and, and do its uh, advertising job, job through that. So what I would like to point is that in that sense Sherlock is much more uh, straight to the point and probably the only, if you can call it that way on it, and I think that we can, the only avant-garde movement which, which is still here and didn't really change the definitions of freedom which was uh, set up in 1984 is uh, is, is, is GNU movement and uh, that's probably the best example how to stay for a very long, uh, uh, very long time uh, here and uh, I think it says also to capitalism try to assimilate this and we are in the, in the year where uh, there are some suspicious about it because uh, GNU GPL version 3 is trying actually to deal with that but I think that GPL uh, version 2 did its job quite well well, let me that interrupt sense. you here. I think that you've yeah. got a great point, okay. but if you'd like to have a conversation, I'd love to talk to you after this, but you do have some really excellent points. Where do we draw those lines? And I think that in a lot of cases, we have to choose that. I think that 
The duty of the artist, the duty of the shaman, the duty of the hacker is to go to the edges of society and to bring those things back to everybody else. It's our duty to go into the dream world, to go into the hidden places, and I'm talking about those places that the government doesn't want you to see just as much as those places that your own psyche doesn't want you to see. It's our duty as these people to bring those things back to the rest of society and to open those up. So exactly the way that you choose to do that, I think is an individual choice, and there are a whole panoply of tools in which to do so, but thank you. Anyone else, or are we good? All right, uh, yeah. Jacob asks what I plan to culture jam next. Well, I was really inspired by that story of the children wanting the rocks for breakfast, and so I'd like to turn that around. If perhaps a Stooby Doo sticker will cause the children to choose the banana over the cupcake, maybe we can do this with adults too, as a way of combating all the hideously unhealthy food we've got. So I was thinking about maybe putting pictures, uh, little stickers of sexy women like this on the label for broccoli. That's what I've got in mind. All right, well, thank you very much, and have a great time here.